Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. Those were the words spoken by Franklin Delano Roosevelt, 73 days before the issuing of Executive Order 9066, an order that led to the birth of 10 incarceration camps and imprisoned many U.S. citizens. What happened didn't happen to 120,000 Japanese Americans, it happened to 120,000 people. Everything is taken away from them. The Japanese Americans knew their rights were abused. They knew they were marked as traitors by a country they loved. They knew of the hardships that would follow incarceration. What they did not know yet was how a small, disempowered community could find a strength and voice to stand up against the United States by asking for an apology and redress. With the signing of the Civil Liberties Act of 1988, compensation was assured. While the Japanese American or Nikkei redress had been a momentous step in history during its time, its legacy of the fight for personal rights has slowly diminished in the modern society. Following Executive Order 9066, the Japanese American Citizens League, or JACL, responded with opposition. However, it quickly agreed to cooperate with the government after a unanimous vote. Even before World War II was over, the incarceration and exclusion were challenged legally by individuals. March 28, 1942, Minoru Yasui turned himself in for violating the imposed curfew, earning a year of prison time. May 16, 1942, Gordon Hirabayashi turned himself in for failing to register for incarceration. He received five years. May 30th, 1942, Fred Korematsu was arrested for being a Jap. He took his case all the way to the Supreme Court. Finally, on July 12, 1942, Mitsue Endo filed a habeas corpus petition that eventually won in the Supreme Court and influenced the closing of the camps. By the end of March 1946, all 10 incarceration camps were closed. We didn't come out of camp saying, hey, we deserve an apology, we deserve redress. I mean, they lost their jobs, their neighborhoods, everything, right? So what was on their minds was putting a roof over their heads, putting food on the table, sending their kids to school, getting a job, rebuilding their community. That was the number one thinking, right? But there was also another feeling, and that feeling was a feeling of shame. And there was a feeling that somehow we had done something wrong as Americans to cause this to happen to ourselves. In 1970, Edison Uno proposed a redress resolution at a JACL convention, sparking the genesis of the modern redress movement. Although the resolution was discussed thoroughly, no actions were taken regarding the reparations. The first redress legislation was introduced on June 28, 1974, by George E. Danielson, a California Democrat. It died quickly in the subcommittee. An initial survey in 1975 from the JACL chapters indicated that dissensions were present. 15% opposed obtaining any form of reparations. The fight for redress could not continue when no apparent progress could be made, and the morale of the Nikkei community was low. Three members from the Seattle JACL Evacuation Redress Committee made an effort to break the stagnancy. On February 19, 1976, President Gerald Ford issued a formal apology for the issuing of Executive Order 9066. The event provided hope for the Nikkei community. The 96th Congress met in 1979. Multiple proposed redress bills were quickly rejected. However, it was not a complete setback. The Commission on Wartime Relocation and Internment of Civilians CWRIC, Act passed after much debate. The Commission's goal was to conduct official study of the impact of Executive Order 9066. Just when things appeared to be getting better, Ronald Reagan and many Republican senators were elected. Obtaining the redress now looked like an impossible dream, but the dedication of organizations such as the NCRR and NCJAR, the cooperative effort of the community, and the leadership of a few people would turn this dream into a reality. In 1986, Yuri Kajihara was elected to be the president of the JACL. Under his leadership, the JACL focused its primary attention on the issue of redress. I was shocked to learn that we had money so that the redress program for JACL may have to be terminated. That uh, persistency got us where we wanted to get. 
working alongside Mr. Kajihara was Grant Ujifusa, the JCL Legislative Strategy Chair and also a Republican. Around the same time, the CWRIC published its findings. In sum, Executive Order 9066 was not justified by military necessity. A grave personal injustice was done. The excluded people suffered enormous damages and losses. All that remained now was to wait for the next congressional meeting. The 100th Congress was a pivotal point in the redress process. Tom Foley, a legislative representative, introduced H.R. 442 on January 6, 1987. This bill was so far the best means of redress, balancing a monetary restitution with a formal apology. The commission finished, I kept working uh, with whatever group was available, particularly the National Council for Japanese American Redress, NCJAR. And my husband testified for the JACL uh, legislative bill in 442. After nine months of congressional labor by the neat case in Congress, H.R. 442 made its way onto President Ronald Reagan's desk. No one knew how he was going to respond. When Uchifusa asked the White House pollster, he was told, People over at the White House say they've drawn their wagons in a circle and they don't want this bill at all. It was then that the Nikkei community made one final push to get Reagan to support the redress movement by relaying a message to the president. On August 10, 1988, after more than eight years of unfaltering perseverance, the Nikkei case finally managed to obtain redress. President Reagan signed Bill H.R. 442, sending a formal apology for the actions of the United States accompanied by a monetary payment of $20,000 to all surviving incarcerated Nikkeis. I think at that time it was just a feeling of jubilation because it made you feel justified in speaking out against the, uh, the incarceration. However, the Nikkei redress was only the genesis of a long fight for personal rights. While it was a relatively fruitful experience for the Nikkeis living in America, many fragments of unresolved issues remained. They came up with this idea of abducting people of Japanese ancestry from Central and, and South America. Yeah, they said, well, we can use them as hostages. They're not American citizens. We violated, as a nation, international accords for the treatment of civilians in a time of war. Little changes were made to public policy. No laws were passed that guaranteed personal rights to future generations. Even the apology lacked sincerity. So there was no remorse in that letter. They're saying, we know how precise you guys are, how you love to have meticulous attention detail, and we are sending you a letter in which we don't even put, we don't even put your name in there. And we could do it because there's something called mail merge. September 20th, 2001, President Bush declares war on terror shortly after 9-11. This time, it is no longer the Nikkei's. case. Individuals from Muslim countries lined up and waited for their turn to be photographed, fingerprinted, and interrogated simply because they came from countries that were deemed suspect. Many were even detained or arrested as a result. Never again. You know, we thought, oh boy, once we get readers passed, this is it. Well, it turned out there's a lot of unfinished business. In 2001, a vote was called on for the Authorization for Use of Military Force Bill, which granted the President supreme authority to detain anyone the U.S. finds to be involved in the terrorist attacks. Not a single Congress member questioned the impact of the bill on personal rights, except for Barbara Lee. The Patriot Act also passed in 2001 and again in 2006, permitting the indefinite detention or incarceration of immigrants without a trial. It was followed by the Guantanamo Bay Detention Center. These decisions by the U.S. were very similar to those made back in World War II regarding the Nikkei case. The Nikkei redress was a momentous step in a world filled with conflicts of rights and responsibilities. When we talk about an individual's and community's understanding of justice, love of justice, and fighting for the American way, then this story isn't about one ethnic group, it's about all Americans. No matter how far we think we've made it, no matter how secure we think we are, no matter how much money we have in the bank, you know, this country is bigger than any of us and we need to be ever vigilant that our rights and the rights of others are never violated. The legacy of the Nikkei redress is slowly fading. Maybe it's time to bring it back.